Hello. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Annette and I work within the marketing team at HR Assured. Thank you for taking some time out of your busy day to join our webinar, Psych Man Managing Psychological Hazards in the Modern Workplace. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with HR Assured, um, we're part of FCB Group and we help businesses navigate around Australia and New Zealand's complex employment laws by providing a range of services and products to ensure businesses are compliant. When you partner with HR Assured, you'll have access to our award-winning services. Uh, some of them are the 24-7 telephone advisory service, HR audit, WHS and HR software, which is our HRA cloud, insurance and representation, and a library of legal resources. Today's webinar will be presented by Adrian Turner, HR Short Senior Product Manager and General Counsel at FCB Group. Adrian draws on his technical expertise in employment and commercial law, and along with his business acumen to deliver tailored advice and practical solutions to our clients. Okay, welcome Adrian, and thanks for coming along to present this webinar. Can you take us through what you'll be presenting today? Yeah, thanks very much, Annette. <clears throat> it, it's great to be with everyone today, have a chat about something that really could not be um, any more topical or relevant to how business are being managed at the moment, and that's the management of psychological injuries in the modern workplace. Um, I say modern with a degree of emphasis because the COVID pandemic has so significantly altered how businesses operate and the environment that workers are working in, and that has naturally added a level of complexity to health and safety issues in the traditional work environment. Um, the other reason we thought it was so important to speak to you all on this topic is probably the area that seems to be the most overlooked within the workplace relations law sphere as it relates to psychological um, injuries. Is that of workplace health and safety or WHS, believe it or not? Um, that may be down to the fact that workplace psychological injury illnesses, um, uh, the cases and actions around them are far more likely to manifest under legal jurisdictions than they are under the traditional WHS jurisdiction, um, given those jurisdictions all those other jurisdictions are compensatory in nature for the employee. However, I think that, um, I guess, organisational naivety um, to the WHS lens um, that we need to be viewing these issues through is somewhat concerning because we know that under the model Australian WHS law, businesses have a statutory duty of care to manage health and safety risks to its workers, both physical and psychological. And the business are held accountable to a significant penalty regime under the WHS law instances where something goes wrong. Um, and that's not to mention the other tremendous cost to business when health and safety is not managed appropriately, which we'll discuss a bit later on. And of course, um, naturally, the WHS framework has only become more relevant to how psychological issues in the workplace are monitored and regulated with the rapid shift to working from home through the COVID pandemic over the past 18 months. Um, what we're seeing with this shift to remote work arrangements for so many employers is regulatory changes and legal precedent, really trying to keep pace with the changing work environment with a view to protecting the health and safety of the employees during these um, challenging times. The result is, a, 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 I think it's a shifting compliance landscape for employers and it makes it even more important that they're across this new normal, if you like, in, in managing WHS risks in work from home arrangements. So I think with all that in mind, we thought it was important to take you through a bit of a refresher, first of all, and the um, on the WHS law and the regulatory framework so that you can look at these issues through that WHS prism, um, provide a bit of an overview of what psychological hazards are and how they manifest in the workplace have a look at a case um, that demonstrates the complexity of dealing with these issues um, before providing some practical tips and guidance on how to establish a robust WHS system to ensure your business is discharging its legal obligations and reducing the, I guess, consequential organisational risk that stems from not doing so. Okay, so as I'm sure um, 
um, many of you would at least have a rudimentary understanding of um, WHS law and the WHS framework. And this slide sets out um, the three main classifications of persons, I guess, you, or people within the workplace under WHS law um, with differing levels of responsibilities and liabilities attached to each category. Um, those categories are PCBUs, officers and workers. Um, and it's important that we can recognise who's who in our business so that we can probably understand um, who is responsible for what and where the respective liabilities lie. Um, even more principally, and to take things all the way back to basics, um, the most fundamental concept in WHS law is that employers have a duty of care to ensure the safety and wellbeing of people within their workplace. This is the primary legal responsibility that overarches pretty much everything in the WHS space and, and really all responsibilities and obligations fall out of that duty. Um, it's important to point out that unlike employment law, um, WHS is governed at a state level with different WHS acts in each state. However, the, the legislation is harmonised and the requirements across each state are substantially similar. Um, and critically for the purposes of our discussion today, the, the model WHS Act defines health as including both physical and psychological health. And these psychological issues have also come to be referred almost interchangeably as psychosocial issues. So a number of you may have seen that, um, that or that word reference in various codes of practice, depending on where what um, jurisdiction you're in. But, you know, it, essentially it, it means the same thing. And for the purpose of the exercise of today, I'll, I'll sort of refer to them interchangeably. Um, but for the most part, psychological um, issues. So just... Um, uh, what exactly is a PCBU? Uh, you know, a PCBU is what it stands for as a person conducting a business or undertaking. And in its purest form, a PCBU is, is anyone who's operate, operating a business. Uh, it can be an organisation, but it can also be an individual, so long as that individual is conducting the business in their own right. For instance, you know, a sole trader or someone who's a self employed person. Now, PCBUs are the ones who have a legal duty to ensure the health and safety of workers so far as reasonably practical. And we'll get to the importance of that phrase in a moment, but the responsibility essentially can be generalised into duties such as ensuring the work environment, um, systems and work, machinery, equipment are all safe and properly maintained. And that goes for psychological issues as well, obviously. Ensuring proper consultation with all the workers and other PCBUs at a work site or in an office about health and safety matters, that's critical ensuring workplace facilities are available, ensuring information, training, instruction and supervision are provided and ensuring, you know, workers' health and workplace conditions are monitored um, and reducing or, or resolving, I should say, WHS issues promptly and, and notifying incidents um, to the relevant authorities where you're required to do so. Um, the next category is, is officers. Um, the best way to think about officers are they, they're, under the WHS Act, they're the people in roles within organisations who exercise a high level of influence or control over the business's operations. They could be the business owner, you know, a C-level executive or a manager, a senior employee, or even someone in HR. And under the WHS legislation, officers have um, individual duties exercise what we call due diligence to ensure compliance with WHS obligations. Um, officers are the ones within the business who have that responsibility to ensure that the PCBU has in place appropriate systems of work um, and must actively monitor and evaluate health and safety management. So due diligence is really about safety leadership. It's, it's taking those active steps to ensure that the company is compliant with all its WA obligations at law. Um, and it, the, the, the law prescribes that in undertaking that due diligence, officers must be able to demonstrate that they've taken reasonable steps to you know, acquire and update their knowledge about health and safety, understand the operations that have been carried out by the business um, and the risks and hazards associated with those um, operations, ensure that the business has and uses appropriate resources and processes to eliminate and reduce health and safety risks, um, and 
basically to receive and respond promptly to information regarding incidents, hazards and risks. The, the people within the organisation, and, and many of you will be this, who with respect to psychological hazards are responsible for really having that broad view um, and understanding the operations and the service delivery within the business and how and what are the risks and hazards that drop out of that and how do you manage them. It, a lot of that time, the individual responsibility is going to fall to the officers. And so a failure to adequately discharge those duties leads to serious penalties for the PCBU and the individual officers via accessorial liability. Um, and so it's critical that businesses and the officers within them are, are well across what they need to have in place. Um, the final category um, is, is probably the most straightforward and, and that's been, um, and that's that of workers. Uh, and effectively that's any person who carries out work in any capacity for a PCBU. Um, that they can be employees, you know, trainees, apprentices, volunteers, contractors, um, employees of contractors, labour hire employees, essentially anyone who's, who's operating um, work on um, the, the PCBU's premises or, or for the PCBU. Um, and their principal duties are relatively um, straightforward and easy to understand, but not always understand, how, not always as easy to understand what the liability lies, but um, essentially they had to take reasonable care for their own health and safety, take reasonable care for the health and safety of others, comply with reasonable instructions, policies and procedures um, that are given to them by their PCBU. And they, they can also be held personally liable for serious breaches and gross negligence um, in not complying with those duties. Same. So just very briefly before I get into the nitty gritty of, of the psychological um, sphere, I also wanted to quickly touch on the meaning of the term reasonably practical as it's, it's critical that those of you who are in charge of running businesses um, because it is the standard for how far businesses and individuals need to go in discharging their WHS obligations. Unfortunately, it's one of these phrases that lawyers love to stick in legislation so that when something occurs and it's time to decide what actually happened and where the liabilities lie, only they can decipher it. Um, but essentially, it, it means doing what you are reasonably able to in order to ensure the health and safety of workers um, and others like volunteers and visitors. Basically, PCBUs always need to try and eliminate so far as reasonably practicable any health and safety risks in the workplace, but if the risk can't be eliminated, then they need to reduce the risk so far as reasonably practical in the circumstances. So as I alluded to, um, what is considered reasonable in any one instance is, um, is something that only turns on the facts of that particular circumstances, but it does take into account things like the likelihood of the hazard or risk having occurred, the degree of harm and the possible consequences out of it, um, the, the state of knowledge about the risk, the availability and suitability of ways of eliminating or, or minimising it. Um, so effectively what the person in the PCBU knows or ought to have reasonably known about the risk and the ways to eliminate it. Um, so I think to bring an even sharper focus to um, the importance of not overlooking the WHS framework, um, whenever we're discussing WHS compliance, it needs to be done having regard to the immense penalty regime that's enforced in this space and the fact that WHS is a criminal jurisdiction. Um, the, the sheer scale of the penalties that stem from non-compliance can be cataclysmic for, for both businesses um, or both the business um, with the maximum penalty for a company being around $3 million and for the individual officers who have specific personal duties under the model laws, facing up to five years imprisonment and a $600,000 fine. So as far as psychological injuries are concerned, in addition to the, the WHS regime specifically, you obviously also have the possibilities um, of action under the Fair Work Act, and various state and federal discrimination acts, and of course, workers' compensation claim that all arise from psychological injuries in the workplace. And coupled with that, those possible legal consequences are the, um, the obvious internal consequences that stem from psychological injuries that you all um, are no doubt aware of, such as you know, increases in unplanned absences, employee attrition, withdrawal and absenteeism, um, and poor work quality. 
So the combined effect of all these possible ways that businesses can be held liable only serves, I think, to highlight how important it is to be proactively managing these risks in your businesses rather than in a reactionary manner. Thanks, Adrian. Um, I just want to also tell the audience, if you do have questions along the way, there is that Q&A um, feature at the bottom of the screen there. Just pop in your questions as you go along and we will get to those questions at the end because um, I can see a couple of people raising their hands. So um, yeah, we'll just do that at the end there. Okay, Adrian, um, certainly that's a lot to think about what you've just told us. Um, can you explain what a psychological hazard is at work and how do they occur? Sure. So psychological hazards are essentially aspects of work and situations that may cause a stress response um, and which in turn, in turn can lead to psychological or physical harm. In essence, they stay, stem from um, the way the tasks or job are designed, organised, managed and supervised. Tasks or jobs where there are inherent psychological or psychosocial hazards and risks, the equipment, working environment, or requirements to undertake duties in physically hazardous environments, um, and social factors at work, you know, workplace relationships and social interactions. You, I think you'll see on this slide that um, some of the more common hazards in the workplace, and you're probably reading that thinking, is there any situation that isn't a potential hazard? And I completely understand that. What that list does, I think, is, is underscore the complexity of understanding and managing these issues, because on the one hand, you've got over demand of an employee being a hazard, and you've also got under demand. So that's, you know, can be difficult to compute. And how do we reconcile that as managers in creating our safe system as work and, and ensuring that, you know, we are managing all of those hazards um, and doing everything we can to discharge our obligations. Um, for a bit of perspective, you know, let's have a think about a fairly live example for all of us at the moment. If you think about the typical employee working from home during the current lockdown, no doubt they're under pressure to continue to deliver work to their employer and keep the business active during a, a really challenging time, but they're doing so in an environment where they're trapped in their apartment um, without an ability to interact with their managers or colleagues um, and without an ability to change their working environment and interact even with their family in many cases. Um, so there's just absolutely going to be hazards um, from that, um, from a psychological perspective in particular, in the same way the slippery floor is a, a physical hazard. Um, and without, I guess, the organic risk control measures that family, friends, social life um, without them available with, to the, the, the people in your workforce. These hazards quickly manifest into injuries for workers when it, it all becomes too much. Um, very much in the same way a slippery floor creates a risk of a physical injury if there are not control measures in place to minimise um, that risk. And so the, the WHS Act and the regulations make it incumbent on um, PCBUs to manage these risks so far as reasonably practical to ensure the health and safety of workers. So while no doubt um, there is, I guess, some cognitive dissonance in some of the items that are on the screen and um, those being quote unquote hazards, um, really anything that occurs in the workplace that affects your workers mentally or negatively impacts wellbeing can be considered a hazard that creates a risk that needs to be controlled. Um, and there is now so much emphasis on addressing those issues, given the toll we know our people are under in the pandemic. Um, and the government has responded to that changing working landscape through recent state and federal agreement to include, um, or expressly include, I should say, psychological hazards as part of workplace health and safety regulations in an attempt, um, or a more acute attempt, to prevent mental illness, sexual harassment, and other psychological and psychosocial injuries in the workplace. Um, the power to regulate the elimination or reduction of those hazards has always been available to regulators under the WHS law. However, it's only now that there's specific and express regulations in respect of eliminating or reducing those psychosocial slash psychological hazards. Um, and so there's now a very bright light shining on the need to reduce injuries and illnesses stemming from those, those hazards. And so I guess the combined effect of the increasing regulatory light that's been shone on ensuring workers are protected when working from home, the governmental amendments to the regulations, 
and the way courts and tribunals are viewing modern work arrangements is that without a detailed and planned system for safe work um, for your employees when they're working from home, if an incident or an injury occurs, a psychological one, then the business and the individuals are held responsible and exposed to a tremendous risk that is probably the most severe across all the jurisdictions. Um, Okay, thanks, Adrian. Um, so obviously there's a growing body of legal cases that demonstrate how these issues can all come to a head. I understand that you have one case in particular that you'd like to take everyone through, which underscores how that bright light you just spoke of um, being shown on psychological issues in at work, how employers will be held liable for psychosocial incidents that occur when employees are working from home. Yeah, so the case I wanted to talk about is, is, is one called Gibson and Comcare. Um, and that's essentially where a re remote management arrangement did not absolve a supervisor of his responsibilities to look after employees' mental health. Um, it's not a WHS case per se um, in that it, it, it occurred in the, the workers' compensation jurisdiction, but it does underscore the complexity that the courts are starting to deal with when assessing whether an employer is liable for these psychological injuries. Um, the case involves an employee of a government agency whose tenure spanned over two decades and who had been temporarily promoted for a 12 month period. He spent the latter six months working under the supervision of a remote manager. Um, so the employee was in Sydney and the manager was in Melbourne. Um, the manager would usually communicate with the Sydney team by phone calls, emails, and occasionally video conference. Um, in, in 2018, after returning to his former role as an analyst, an ear, nose and throat specialist suspected that the employee had a mood disorder. After investigating the, um, the specialist suspicions, a psychiatrist diagnosed the employee with severe major depression, anxiety and panic attacks. Um, the psychiatrist was concerned the employee had a suicidal ideation, so he prescribed medication to the employee, which improved the severity of the depression. So this is where it all gets, I guess, a little bit complicated. The employee um, claims that his psychological injury actually pertained to 2016-17 period where he was temporarily placed on high duties while working under remote supervision. Um, it's only retrospectively that he realised he was suffering at that time. Um, and so he put in a workers' compensation claim for Comcare for the first six months of 2017. Comcare denied financial liability, claiming that the injury was diagnosed um, in 2018. It didn't occur in 17, as the employee was suggesting. So the, the tribunal had to determine a few things, you know, whether or not the psychological injury occurred due to personal or, or work-related matters, if the timing of the psychological injury occurred when the employee claimed it did, and if the employee had been given a reasonable workload and adequate support from his remote manager. In all instances, the tribunal actually sided with the employee. Um, although the deputy president um, presiding over the case was pretty hesitant around it, noting that the remote working arrangement of the relationship made things more complicated. Um, in the end, it, it wasn't enough to absolve him of the responsibility to ensure the employee's psychological safety. Um, although the employee wasn't aware of his condition in 2017, the, um, the president presiding over it was satisfied that there was enough evidence to show the employee had been overworked, um, including you know, his flex time records increasing um, from 25 hours to 72 hours. Um, his records show that his performance suffered during the, temp um, the temporary promotion period and, he, wasn't give, and he, he claimed at least he wasn't given adequate support from his supervisor um, and he claims it was implied that he, um, there was an expectation that he'd stay back late to finish work. Um, his partner, um, who he also works with, you know, offered a detailed account of his mental state saying he would return home um, from work most days with circles under his eyes and he wasn't sleeping well, he lacked energy. Um, and that generally um, he was extremely burnt out and stressed. And so that case does underscore how the design of the job and the work environment created psychological hazards and the business did not do, or it was found that they did not do, um, everything reasonably practical to identify and control the risks um, stemming from the hazards. 
Okay, thanks Adrian. So piecing this all together a bit, can you give everyone a rundown on how businesses might go around about spotting these hazards and what is required to manage those hazards? Yeah, absolutely. So while that case isn't, a, as I said, a, a WHS prosecution per se, it demonstrates where the law is currently at in terms of employers' responsibility to ensure the health and safety of their employees in a work from home arrangement. Employers just must have a, a detailed and planned system of safe work for its employees when working from home. There is no real distinction in how the law will view psychological injuries um, between the main place of business and the home office in a work from home arrangement. And so businesses absolutely must have a robust and detailed management system in place so that there's an infrastructure there um, to discharge your duties. Um, that means in my opinion, the need to take very much a blue, blue collar systems based approach to risk management, even in white, um, white collar and office related settings and, and work from home arrangements. And what I mean by that is blue collar industries have been grappling with what is required to, to comply with WHS obligations for some time. Um, and many of you will be aware that, you know, in construction work, it requires extremely detailed systems and plans for safe work. Um, but Typical safety standards and codes of behaviour that are set out in detail in a work site or a large office um, can become afterthoughts in a work from home arrangement um, where we can have a tendency to think that employees are at home and out of sight, out of mind to an extent. Um, but we know that the law doesn't distinguish between physical work site um, and the home office. And those hazards remain hazards that need to be managed in a work from home setting the same way that I mentioned before, the slippery floor that's not managed creates that physical risk of injury. And so practically speaking, um, what is required from a risk management perspective is, is shown um, on that image on the slide, which I'm sure is known to some of you. Um, and it demonstrates that the business must approach psychological hazards and risks with the same fundamental principles to the way that a blue collar employer manages high risk construction work. That is, you know, at, at, its, at its most basic level, there needs to be a system in place that identifies the hazard, i.e. find out what it is that would cause harm, assess the risk, so understand the nature of the harm that could be caused by the hazard, how serious the harm could be and the likelihood of it happening. Um, control the risk, so implement the most effective control measures that um, is reasonably practical in the circumstances and ensure it remains effective over time and regularly review um, your control measures and ensure that they're working as planned. So having a, a detailed risk assessment system means that in the event of an injury or illness, the business did everything in its power to reduce the risk of it occurring and has therefore discharged its obligation under the Act. Um, you know, having said all of this and, and laid out, I think at a high level at least, um, how these issues need to be managed in accordance with the law, I also don't want to understate the difficulty of remote managers um, getting an accurate read, um, or anyone for that matter, getting an accurate read on employees' wellbeing and understanding where the line is between guidance and pressure. Um, as we all know, it's very easy for remote st staff to disguise their mental health struggles. Um, or even manipulate situations. Um, but there are measures you can do to actively prevent this. So um, it's important that if something was to occur, that you can demonstrate that you had a system in place and were taking the active steps to have all um, workers work um, in a safe way so that you are in that defensible position if, if something um, unfortunate occurs. Um, so using the blue collar industries again as an example, there have been many employers who you know, set out a safe method of work at a work site in detail, but where an employee has suffered a serious injury or died after not adhering to those procedures. In those cases, you know, telling them what to do isn't necessarily enough. You, you have to create the safe work environment and ensure employees are working or your workers are working in accordance with those procedures so that you've got measures in place to ensure that they're doing that. Um, you know, you, you can offer stand up desks to employees, but how often and how strictly are you encouraging your workers to use it? You know, you can do the same with wellbeing measures and an EAP. If you cult, um, they're great, they're fantastic things to have in place and um, things that all businesses should have in place. But if your culture um, encourages overworking um, or your demands and goals are set at a high level where only um, of the only way that employees can deliver is to work longer hours, then you're going to have a problem. 
Um, I know that at HR Assured over the last sort of period of time during the pandemic, we've been inundated with requests for working from home policies, checklists and other procedures um, and callers needing to know where their obligations sit um, in managing employees working from home. And whilst a number of these organisations had employees operating under a work from home framework already, um, at times it was without a proper WHS framework in place to manage their risks um, while their employees are working from home. Um, businesses, you need to take this seriously and, and to ensure that um, they have a safe um, system of work in place, not only for simple hazards like home office, um, but for these psychological issues, which are only going to be more pre um, prevalent as, as lockdowns continue and work from home in trenches as, as the new normal. Sorry there, I couldn't get to my unmute. <laughs> okay, Adrian. So what do you mean when you say safety culture? Why is this so important for businesses? Yeah, so before I touch on um, some of the more specific hazard and risk control measures that should be in place, I wanted to helicopter up a bit and, and talk about um, the importance of an overarching safety culture within your business. Um, as we all know, workplace culture is, is now a you know ubiquitous and almost overused term in our sphere. But when it comes to managing your WHS duties, it's just absolutely fundamental to have a positive safety culture in your business that overarches your actual system of work. Um, you must create a proactive system that is preventative rather than simply responding to issues and chasing your tails. Um, if you wanna be in a sound and defensible position in the event of an incident, um, as an employer, it's really your responsibility to set the behaviour standards that provide a safe workplace for your workers. Um, your culture sets the standard of, of how um, you prioritise the wellbeing of your workers and how well um, you respond to issues and keep them safe and healthy. Your culture and standards of behaviour need to be lived by managers and really demonstrable to employees. Um, it needs to be seen and, and able to be evidenced, basically. Um, if you embed a priority on worker wellbeing and safety in your culture, these more specific measures that I'll talk to in a second will feel so much easier to implement and be adopted in your workplace because your workers actually feel the culture wrapped around the system. Um, and again, it's so important because a business, it's almost, you're almost never going to be able to entirely remove the chance of a psychological injury occurring in your workplace. But Having an ingrained safety culture and a risk mitigation system allows your business to be in a position to evidence that it actually did have a safe system of work in place and it did all things reasonably practical to minimise the risk, um, albeit that they couldn't reduce it to a zero. Um, and therefore, they've done enough to avoid liability. Okay, so... Um, if discharging your duties um, and reducing your risk is about creating a system or the framework for managing... Um, these types of issues, what are the types of things specifically or elements of a system that you need to consider that underpin a safe working system? Um, the first one is obviously just creating a safe physical and online work environment. Um, we need to ensure that workers' environment is, is safe. So no matter the workspace, it, it needs to be secure, have good natural surveillance and be well lit. You can imagine what it's like working in the environment when that's not the case and that how that affects your psyche or the way that you approach work and, and your emotions. Um, measures need to be placed um, or in place to monitor employee health and well-being as, at the same time. So check-in surveys um, to ensure employees are aware of support programs um, like EAP and wellbeing services are being encouraged to actively use them or goes into that environment and that feeling of safety that employees will have when those things are in place. Um, just as important is that the safe systems of work and procedures that I've sort of touched on throughout the presentation. You know, we've discussed the importance on your system a lot. And, and what we mean by it is that um, it's how you go about your operations. How are you doing the tasks um, that your business is set up to do? And are you doing it in a safe manner? You know, is, is safety and protection of um, your employee wellbeing embedded in how you go about your operations? You know, do you have a current and functional risk register in place where all the hazards and risks that crop up in your business are recorded and managed through? Um, 
things like regularly checking in with your workers, um, particularly where they're in a remote environment, you know, discussing workplace policies and expected standards um, of behaviour become really important. Um, for harassment hazards, um, you know, it, it's a functional system in place for addressing power imbalance and reporting structures where one gender may hold the most um, or the majority of the decision-making positions is a system in place for reviewing worker tasks um, and priorities and resourcing. Is there an escalation policy in place that workers understand and have access to for serious incidents? These are all elements of a system um, and something that you can document in um, as being in place to be in that defensible position that we've discussed. Um, you know, the, the other one which you, everyone knows about across all the elements of workplace relations, but, you know, implementing best practice workplace policies is, again, fundamental in this area as well. It's so important to be um, reviewing um, your, your policies and procedures to ensure they're equipping your employees with the information and tools requisite to protect psychological safety to the extent reasonably practical. Um, appropriate policies help determine your employees if they've been provided with clear lawful and reasonable directions about the performance of work from home you know including you know start and finish times attendance in, in training on work, work and health um, whs um, matters you know taking breaks attending virtual opportunities to socialize with the remainder of the workplace um, well drafted and propagated policies will help you set out um, how you prevent and respond to mental health issues in your workplace. For example, a mental health policy is something we've been assisting clients with more and more in the current environment. And that sets out how the business promotes mental wellbeing of the workplace, but also how it responds to issues. Um, you know, and once, it, once those policy and procedures in place, regular training and information on them is just as important. Um, they need, or your workers need to understand how working under um, the policies and procedures works and what is expected of them in order to promote a safe work environment. Regular training for your workers in assessing hazards and reporting risks um, will ensure everyone, I think, in your business is pulling together um, on health and safety and, and singing from the same song sheet, if you like. Um, and the next one, uh, addressing behaviour and hazards that are unsafe early on in the piece. Part of that proactive culture that I mentioned earlier is addressing hazards and unsafe issues as soon as possible. Um, what we're seeing at the moment through you know, signs of burnout, stress, overload, um, and, and other mental demand is it, it's just at, at, at unprecedented levels. Um, and it's crucial that you have measures in place to control those risks and you need to be doing it early. So taking sexual harassment um, as, a, as an example of a psychosocial, psychological issue. You know, sometimes lower level, but still unacceptable forms of harassment can be seen as part of, you know, daily working life, like sexual jokes, gender teasing, or giving inappropriate nicknames to coworkers. You know, those small acts of harassment may be more easily ignored, but they're behaviors that quickly escalate to more serious forms of harassment and create a culture where workers don't feel safe or supported to report sexual harassment and which quickly manifests into more serious issues and injuries that you'll have to manage and where you'll have liability. So employees need to see and feel how the business acts on unsafe work and be empowered to do it proactively themselves at the same time. Um, in the same manner, you, you wanna be in culture in that culture of actually reporting the hazards in unsafe work. So building on that cultural piece, again, it's important that workers are provided with a range of you know, user-friendly and accessible ways to report hazards, incidents and risks and be talking to um, management about how they're um, coming about in the workplace. So whether that be informally, formally, anonymously or confidentially, um, they need to have a way to do that and understand what that way is. Um, and so that they, they know how to report incidents and they understand the support and protection and advice that's going to be available to them um, in the instance that it occurs. Um, and, you know, the, the, the final one, I think, um, which is it's crucial is, is consultation. And, you know, consultation um, is a prescribed requirement under the model WHS law, but even more fundamentally, um, consultation with workers and other people will help you identify the hazards and risks that can lead to psychological issues 
um, and give you ideas about how to control them. So, you know, anyone who's familiar with the WHS law knows that you have to, you are actually, it's mandated that you consult with your workers about all the health and safety matters that affect them. But like I said, it goes beyond that and it informs your culture and it informs how you respond um, to issues in your workplace um, by making it sort of a, a mandated internal procedure that you go through to ensure that you're putting the right measures in place and you're taking into account the views of your workers. Um, as it relates to psychological issues, that's that's so much more important because you don't hear about a lot of that stuff unless you have um, a system in place that's triggering you to consult with your people and talk to them about what's going on um, in their day-to-day -day and how it's affecting them. Um, the other one I thought I'd just touch on is just following the codes of practice. You know, we're, we're very lucky um, in, in terms of WHS that the regulators actually have, uh, you know, a bevy of resources available to us that are almost um, the um, informal regulations that um, specify what's required of you in terms of WHS. The, you know, our primary goal is obviously to protect our workers and promote their well-being, but we also want to ensure that we're not liable um, and we're adequately discharging our obligation. So if we can implement the strategies um, from the horse's mouth, so to speak, insofar as following the state government's codes of practices, which are all available on their websites, of which there are one specifically for psychosocial hazards, which I encourage you all to read, um, we're going to go a long way in being able to demonstrate to the regulators if there is an incident that we've done all things reasonably practical to avoid the incident and therefore not be liable. So it's a great way, I think, to and an easy way to familiarise yourself with what's required and be, and understand that you are following the law um, when you've got such great resources like that available. And so I'd encourage everyone, if they haven't already, um, can, can consider the um, the code of practice on cycle social hazards, which you'll find on the um, the government's website, um, and take yourself through that. It's a lot of the content that we've been through today, but I do think with respect to all WHS issues, not just um, psychological uh, hazards and injuries that everyone sort of familiarises with the, themselves with that because it's a great way to sort of embed what's required of you in, in, um, in your brains. So I think that's, that's yeah, that's it for the, for the formal part of the presentation. Um, I haven't been looking at the Q&As, I might just have a quick look now. Yeah, we've got a few coming through, Adrian. Um, so if you do have a question, pop it in now because uh, we will be going through those questions. Um, I'm just going to throw a couple out there to you, Adrian. Um, what are reasonable measures to take to avoid so psychosocial hazards when enacting major organisational change management? It's a very good question. Yeah, it is a good question, and and look, I don't I don't necessarily think that anything changes from what we've just discussed um, in in that presentation. In that, when you're going through a major organisational change, um, there are go you're going to need to be able to have a, a WHS system in place, and so um, you need to be going through the process of understanding exactly what are all your obligations under the WHS Act and ensuring that. Um, you've discharged them all, essentially. And so it's about taking that broad view of your business and saying, well, how do we operate as a business? What are the hazards and risks that um, arise for our workers um, in doing that? Um, and setting up a system that identifies all those hazards, controls them, um, and regularly reviews them. So it's not um, there's, there's no necessarily need to change how you view WHS just because you're going through um, a major organisational change, the same obligations are there, um, but you may need to, depending on the nature of the change and then if you're fundamentally changing your operations, you're going to want to be reviewing your risk register, reviewing um, what hazards uh, and risks that you've identified to make sure that they're still current. Um, but um, if they're not, then just maintaining what you've already got in place. But I'll just imagine that um, it's the exact same point. If you've got a good system in place already, um, from my perspective, it would just be um, ensuring that that now relates specifically to your new model of operations. Thank you, Adrian. Okay, we've got a few questions coming through. Some are in the chat, some are in the Q&A. Um, I'll just address this one here. Um, 
Okay, in your experience, are there any particular triggers for organisations to look at their culture and how that impacts psychosocial hazards? It's an excellent question. Yeah, yeah it's a good question. And, and I think from, from a triggers, I think, you know, a lot of, like I said, a lot of these, a lot of the time, it's very difficult for managers, especially in remote environments, to actually understand what's going on um, with their workers because people um, feel um, like they can't talk about it or they don't want to talk about it or they don't have the type of personality that wants to be seen as someone who is complaining. And so providing forums for employees to provide feedback about how they're going um, to the business will identify these issues for you. So if you have, um, you know, whether they're individual surveys or whether they're, you know, company-wide surveys, ways that you can pull data and figure out what's going on with your employees and what's causing it. So are there management practices that are, that are um, you know, contributing to what's going on with the employee? You don't know until you get that feedback. And so, um, you know, I, I think... I think what I would be doing is setting up a system to get that data from your employees so that you can act on it because you're not going to understand what your issues are a lot of the time until you you ask your employees and once you identify what that what that has it is you know it might be that you know a lot of employees are complaining about the way in which they're managed and being overworked um, and not having the support structures in place for them to do their work um, but if you identify that if you identify that um, there's a number of your workplace going through that, um, then you can assess, well, are what is what we're doing reasonable? Is it reasonable management action? Or is it, are we going too far and are we creating a risk that's going to create burnout and the risk of stress injuries? So I think the biggest tip would be to actually understand what your hazards are through actually talking to your employees. And then you can make a, um, a reasonable assessment of whether that's whether that's reasonable and you, whether you need to act on it or whether you can keep in place what's already there. Okay, thanks. Uh, lots of questions coming through. Um, okay, you mentioned working with organisations to draft a mental health policy. Is there something more on organisations? Um, so is there something more organisations are doing? Uh, and do we have a template that we can share? In respect of policies and procedures or...? I assume that's what the question yeah, is I about. Think, yeah. yeah, there's there's a number. So there, there's obviously a, a suite, I think, in, in what you would call, you know, a, a, a um, best practice management WHS system would entails, um, you know, it's what we provide to, to our clients upon signing up, you know, you know, your fundamental WHS policies and procedures, you know, your risk risk management procedures, um, your WHS um, policy, your evacuation plans, things, um, and then, you know, your mental health policy, your psychological management, um, risk management procedure. They are, they are obviously, how you, how you say, template documents, but they do also need to be um, tailored to your business. Um, and at the same time, whilst WHS, you know, a lot of these issues you need to be able to demonstrate that you've got policies and procedures in place. It's one thing to have them. It's another thing for them to be current and actually be propagated and followed in the workplace. I can't tell you the number of businesses that I've seen who have all of this, you know, it's sort of a set and forget, you know, who have these policies in place, but don't regularly update it, update them and don't um, follow them and ensure that everyone in the business is following them. So at the same time, it's difficult to ensure that that is happening, but, um, you know, you need to be making sure that someone in your business is responsible for ensuring those things um, are in place and being followed. And what policies and procedures are one thing. There's other things, for instance, like a, a risk register um, that is fundamental to managing WHS um, in your business that everyone needs to create for themselves based on what they know of their business. You know, how are they, what are the hazards in your business? How are they being controlled? Um, and um, how they being how they being reviewed on an ongoing basis. So it's a it's a mixture. Um, I think this system of of yes, you know your, your policies and procedures which get you some part of the way, um, but then also creating the culture around them um, that everyone is following those policies and procedures and that you have a mind to WHS and it's a priority. I think that's the starting point. Thanks, Adrian. I'm just scrolling through um, to get to the next question. Um, 
Do you think many organisations have risk registers that are set up to more? Oh, that, I think I just answered that one. Yeah. No, no, uh, right. I can yeah, answer that one. That's, yeah, could we go that one? I, yeah. I think they do. I, I think yeah. it's, it's part of the reason for, um, for a presentation like this in that traditionally um, we think of WHS issues as um, physical physical risks. And you know, if you look at a risk WHS risk register that a board will consider, um, particularly of you know, in, in blue collar industries where it's more um, you know, typical that they're being considered at that level, they will usually contain physical risks um, more so than psychological risks. But when we're in an environment where such a great majority of you know, the workforce is now working from home, the reality is those psychological hazards and risks are far more prevalent and need to be considered more by businesses. Um, and they'll, they'll need to be um, included in those risk registers in a far more diligent manner because I think there's going to be a significant increase in this space. And that's you know, part of the reason why you know, we've, we've done this presentation. But, but certainly if you haven't considered that as part of whatever risk register you have in place, um, that would be you know, strongly recommended that you do. Right. There are just a lot of questions here, Adrian, um, and I think um, we're running out of time. Um, for anyone who we haven't answered your question, um, we will be providing you with a link to register for a free telephone advisory service call. Adrian will speak more on that actually now. Um, so do you want to just tell the audience about our offer there? Yeah, so if you're not already a, a client, um, you know, we, we, we are offering a free consultation with our um, wonderful telephone advisory team who um, provide um, that 24-7 advice to um, our clients. Um, and if you want to give that um, line a call, which we're providing that option to you, they will be able to answer you know, a question or two from you and give you a bit of an insight into how we go about helping um, our clients when you are signed up. Um, some of those questions and most of them will be able to be answered relatively straightforwardly by, by the team. And so I would encourage you if, you, if you're wanting to get an understanding of what we do and the service that we provide in this space, um, I would encourage you to, to, to take that offer up and have a chat to our advisory team who are fantastic. So please, please take that up. Thank you, Adrian. And um, after the session, uh, there'll be an email heading um, your way from Adrian. Um, we're going to be sending you a checklist um, related on this topic and you'll get access to that complimentary call as well. So thank you so much, Adrian, on your presentation. It was incredibly insightful. I can see so many wonderful comments coming through um, on the chat there and um, we're really grateful for your information. Um, enjoy your afternoon, everybody. And stay safe. Thank you. Thanks.